everyone, I'm Anya Parampil, and you're watching Red Lines. The United States has announced charges against Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro. On March 26, the Justice Department unveiled charges against President Maduro and 14 other current and former Venezuelan officials, including the country's industry and defense ministers. The charges focus on alleged illicit activity, including narco-terrorism, corruption, and drug trafficking. In making the announcement, Attorney General William Barr declared the move was, quote, focused on rooting out the extensive corruption within the Venezuelan government, a system constructed and controlled to enrich those at the highest levels of the government. Yet the decision highlighted Washington's hypocrisy when it comes to narco-trafficking in Latin America, with critics pointing out U.S. allies, not Venezuela, are responsible for a majority of the drug running in the region. For example, last year, the brother of Honduran President Juan Orlando Hernandez was found guilty in a multi-million dollar drug and gun running case in a New York court. Prosecutors named Hernandez as a co-conspirator in the case and accused the president of funding his political campaigns with drug money, Yet, the federal government has turned a blind eye to his alleged crimes. Or then there's former Colombian President Alvaro Uribe, who the U.S. government named as a top narco-trafficker in 1991. U.S. President George W. Bush rewarded Uribe with a Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2009, raising questions about its true commitment to holding drug traffickers accountable. In response to the U.S.'s decision to charge President Maduro, the former Vice Secretary General for the United Nations in Vienna, Tino Arlaki, tweeted, quote, The charges against Nicolas Maduro for drug trafficking are political garbage. In 40 years of anti-drug work and as a UN Vice Secretary General, I never came across Venezuela. The U.S. is the first consumer of drugs implied. Colombia is the top producer. Mr. Arlaki joined Red Lines to expand on that tweet, as well as offer an update regarding Italy's fight against coronavirus. Professor Pino Arlaki, welcome to Red Lines. Thank you for making time in your schedule to speak with me. Let's start by discussing these charges announced by the U.S. Justice Department against Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro, as well as some members of his cabinet and other former Venezuelan officials as well. You tweeted saying that in all of your years working in drug law enforcement, paying attention to these thing, the, these stories. You never came across Venezuela as a major narco-trafficker. What was your reaction to this move from the United States? I, I was uh, just uh, simply astonished. I would never think they could go so far. Because... Uh, uh, you can, uh, of course, uh, think uh, that this is a bad government, that they did a lot, a lot of wrong things and so on, but the, I would never think they would use these accusations against uh, uh, this government and against the president, because it is simply absurd. It is uh, uh, something that is not supported by anything, not even by the government of all international and American drug enforcement agencies. I never saw, and there is no trace in any uh, document of DEA, for instance, the Drug Enforcement Agency of the United States, about uh, any important uh, uh, drug trafficking between Venezuela and the USA. The last the report from the United Nations, the Drug Control Office that I directed uh, in the past, doesn't say even one word about Venezuela. And I would say everybody knows that uh, cocaine is produced in Colombia and then exported to the United States through Mexico, organized crime in Mexico, and uh, a couple of uh, Central American countries. Venezuela was never particularly involved in it. I 
I'm dealing with this subject since uh, 40 years. Uh, I was uh, the executive director of the Drug Control Office of the United Nations, and I never been in Venezuela because there was no need to go there. Everyone knows me in Colombia, uh, Peru, Bolivia, in all producing or trafficking countries because I went there many times. But Venezuela really is something out of the blue. And the U.S. government charges this, the Venezuelan government with corruption as well. And they say this drug dealing is part of a wider issue with corruption taking place within the Maduro government. What do you say to that as someone who's followed extensively efforts made by that government to crack down on corruption? This uh, government uh, fought and uh, is fighting strongly corruption in Venezuela. The only limitation they have is they are not able to sell it and to, to inform the rest of the world about it. Uh, this government, Maduro's government, found out that the leadership of uh, PDVSA for years and years, almost 10 years, was uh, profiting from uh, exporting uh, oil and taking a, a kickback on oil exportation and they they realized this government discovered that they indict them they throw them out of their job twice and this is the major the biggest corruption case in the history is something that involves 50 billion dollars in 10 years. Uh, no one knew about that, even me, even myself. I was informed about it, having contact with the government. And then uh, this, uh, most of the people have been accused of that, uh, of course, fled Venezuela. They are in the United States. One a group of them in the United States has been also convicted of corruption. Uh, another group of them are in Europe, in, uh, Spain uh, and other countries. The government of Venezuela is uh, asking for, to extradite them in the country and uh, Interpol, for instance, refuse to follow up the arrest warrant, uh, saying that this is not a, a judicial case, but this is a politically motivated case. Because the first thing these, uh, these uh, uh, crooks do when they are uh, accused, when they are discovered, uh, immediately they declare themselves political prisoner and, uh, and, and the countries and institutions, they believe them. Just to give viewers an idea of how far the Maduro government actually went to combat corruption, we're talking about them actually filing charges against, for example, an individual, Rafael Ramirez, who was serving as the country's UN representative at the time of an investigation. So definitely some serious steps taken there. The U.S. government is essentially charging the Venezuelan government with being an organized ma mafia or mob. Mm -hmm. This is while it's also essentially putting out a hit against the president, saying that it's offering millions of dollars for information leading to Maduro's capture or conviction. You're telling me, though, that you're, you, you see, as someone who did a lot of work investigating the Italian mafia, that the United States may actually be the force acting as an organized crime unit here. Explain why. I believe there is ground, a juridical ground, to indict uh, ministers of the United uh, States, not Trump, uh, because uh, it is not possible to prosecute Trump, because head of states, they have immunity from penal prosecution. But, uh, for instance, the, the Treasury minister could be indicted in a very serious way, there are all the elements, for uh, 
organizing a racket, a mafia racket, to take over the resources of Venezuela. How and why? It is very clear that there is a coordinated actions to take over Venezuela's resources in this way. There are $5 billion of Venezuelan assets actually seized in 15 different countries, and most of this money is seized by either American banks owned, like Portugal, where you have uh, one uh, billion uh, and a half uh, dollar seized Venezuelan money deposited in this bank, who is owned by a vulture fund, American vulture fund, or through a coordinated action with the Bank of England, who is uh, illegally seizing another billion dollar value of Venezuelan gold and other hundreds of million dollars belonging to Venezuelan government that are seized all over, freezed all over uh, Europe and, uh, and uh, outside Europe. First. Uh, second, you have the sanctions. Sanctions can be interpreted from a juridical point of view as a, a attempt to, to take over the resources of Venezuela, the most important resource of Venezuela, which is oil, in, in order to, to make room or, uh, for American companies or control directly the most important uh, resource of Venezuela. And then you have the financial blockade, which is, uh, uh, can be can be interpreted, I am sure that uh, any court will convict uh, this group of the American, uh, in, inside the American government, for an attempt, a mafia attempt, to, to take over. Um, probably, I mean, you can see all these actions as uh, political actions, as an exercise of imperial power. This is a political legitimate interpretation. But you can also, you can also look at all these uh, actions as uh, mafia actions. So it's not a paradox or, a, let's say, an exaggeration to speak about it. I'm sure that a case like this in a domestic court can be successfully uh, prosecuted. On the international stage, however, it's quite difficult to hold the United States and its allies accountable for crimes committed. How no, do you think Venezuela could go about pursuing a case such as that? What did you learn about the structure within the United Nations, for example, during your time in Vienna? And in that same vein, what do you make of Venezuela's case against the United States and its sanction policy, which it recently took up at the International Criminal Court. Uh, my action in the, in the United Nations was about uh, a new strategy in fighting, uh, particularly the production of drugs, of uh, opium in Afghanistan and uh, coca in Colombia, Peru and Bolivia. I organized a special session of the General Assembly of the UN on drug control uh, problem, launching a new strategy. And our action in Afghanistan have been particularly uh, efficient because we, in 2001, in the summer of 2001, we obliged the Taliban to do not produce narcotics. It was the first time in history that uh, narcotics production in the major producing countries has been shut off, as they did. Unfortunately, in October of the same year, uh, the USA invaded Afghanistan, and uh, uh, our effort in, in uh, closing the tap of uh, international narcotics production has been completely banished. 
by the um, agreement that has been done by a top American uh, minister like Mr. Ransfield, who personally dealt and negotiated with the warlord of Afghanistan a kind of agreement by which they would help uh, the uh, government, the American government, in fighting the so-called terrorists in exchange of uh, basic uh, uh, go-ahead in narcotic production. So the following year, in uh, 2002, when in Afghanistan there were hundreds of thousands of uh, foreign troops, narcotics production, which was uh, put to zero the, fall, the previous year, came back as strong as before, and in the following years uh, continued to to increase. And you're, you're saying officials, U.S. officials, as high as U.S. Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld under George W. Bush were involved in negotiating a deal with the Taliban? No, not to the Taliban, with the, with the enemies of the Taliban, with the warlord right. of Afghanistan, we are controlling most of the production of the traffic that have been have been uh, told that uh, they would, the Americans would look the other way around on the drug trafficking mm -hmm. in ex support of the common support in fighting so-called terrorism it, without realizing that so-called terrorists were exactly the same people which we, they were uh, dealing with. Mm. Uh, the second thing I did in the United Nations was the promotion and the approval of the Palermo Convention Against Organized Crime, which is the only convention, international conventions we have that, uh, uh, that actually contrast international organized crime. And this was following extensive work you did on the Italian Mafia, which perhaps yes. unlike some of the organized crime units we see functioning in Latin America or surrounding the drug trade also had extensive relationships with the U.S. national security state. I'm wondering if you can expand on some of that. That was um, basically in the past uh, because uh, as a consequence of our action, action that uh, myself as a, a friend and advisor of a great uh, prosecutor, Judge Giovanni Falcone was killed by organized crime in 1992. Uh, in a bombing, correct? Carried out by yeah, the yeah, mafia. Yeah, Giovanni Falcone and another big, important Italian prosecutor, Paolo Borsellino. We, sacked, we had a historical victory against uh, the Sicilian mafia. Sicilian mafia, after our action, we just accused them did the trial them and put them in jail. Sicilian Mafia today is not anymore a big emergency in Italy, thanks to this action and to the sacrifice of these people. And your hard work as well. I wanted to ask you, since you are in, you're in Rome, correct? Or where are you at the moment? Yeah. Yes, yes. I wanted to ask how exactly the situation in Italy is shaping up. We were all very concerned to see news reports about the dire health situation since the coronavirus outbreak started. What is the latest in Italy? Well, now the peak of the epidemic is, uh, has been reached. Now we have a substantial decrease of the uh, virus. Uh, because Italy followed uh, strictly the Chinese model. Uh, the country has been uh, locked down quickly, and, uh, and the epidemic has been uh, fought since the beginning. So I hope that, uh, that in one, two weeks, the lockdown will be over. We're all happy to hear that the situation then is improving. You served as a member of the European Parliament representing Southern Italy. So I wonder if you could comment about how this coronavirus outbreak exposed some weaknesses within the EU system, how countries such as Italy 
were treated as they grappled with this health disaster? Uh, I'm afraid uh, that uh, the European uh, Union will be the major victim of a coronavirus in, in Europe itself. Because uh, the um, degree of support and solidarity that uh, my country got during this crisis has been uh, almost zero, particularly by a group of North European countries led by Germany, who refused to share any burden as a member of the European Union, particularly the Eurozone, in uh, fighting the virus uh, uh, through uh, the consequences, uh, fighting the consequences of the virus that are the major issue. The major issue is the economic uh, uh, recession that is already going on all over Europe and the lack of a strong uh, uh, strategy to contrast it. So, uh, Europe, the Eurozone particularly, have not been able to mount any substantial uh, answer, reaction to, the, to this threat, which is, I repeat, is a threat that is more dangerous than the virus, uh, the COVID-19. And this is due mostly to the lack of, uh, of um, uniform action in favor of Italy, Spain, France, uh, Portugal, uh, nine uh, important countries that have not been supported by a group of other countries that believe that uh, there is no need for a, for a uh, uniform action. This uh, is creating a huge resentment in uh, most of Italy, in most of uh, Southern Europe, and uh, I believe that if uh, something, some exceptional new event will occur, this will be the end of, at least of the Eurozone, it means the common currency, Euro, and, uh, and Central Bank, the European Central Bank, if not of the all European project. It will be fascinating to see how everything develops and here in the United States, we've yet to truly follow the Chinese or Italian model in terms of the, the response and the safety measures. So I fear the impact, the economic impact here too, and the health impact could be even greater and, and revolutionary perhaps as people start to grapple with a new reality thanks to coronavirus. Pino Arlacchi, again, thank you so much for your time this evening. Thank you. It was a pleasure to talk to you.